In the early centuries of Iceland's history, first permanently settled by Vikings, rule was by powerful chieftains who expected complete allegiance from those under their rule. Following the country's acceptance of Christianity in the year 1000, church leaders were appointed by favor of the chieftain with the expectation of monetary and other benefits to be returned in kind for the privilege of power. Kolbein Tumason was one of the most powerful chieftains of the 12th and 13th centuries. In the year 1203, to the bishopric of Holar, he appointed Gudmundur Erison, known as Gudmund the Good. Tumason was not happy, however, when Gudmund went his own way. Gudmund believed the Catholic Church had been corrupted by the acquisition of wealth and that it should operate independent of governmental authority. Soon after his appointment, the poor were settling around the city of Holar because they found help for their circumstances through Goodman's charity. Twice the bishop was exiled because of his policies. Soon after his return from the first exile, the poor were again receiving charity. Goodman was imprisoned twice, left homeless sent again to Norway in exile. Upon his return to Iceland, now an old man, he lived the remainder of his days in relative obscurity. Gudmund the Good was never named a saint by the Roman Catholic Church, yet in 21st century Iceland he is highly thought of for his godly piety, compassion for the poor, and miracles of legend performed through him. Kolbein Tumason, the chieftain, in dissatisfaction over Goodman's loyalty, in 1208 went to battle with the bishop and Catholic church in Holar. In his 35th year of life, chieftain Kolbein Tumason was killed by a fatal blow to his head during the Battle of Vidines. On his deathbed, he composed Here, Heavenly Creator, a deeply spiritual hymn sung in Iceland still today. The performance we hear was sent to me by my Icelandic friend August Olafsson. The photographs were taken by August in the United States and Iceland. Both are used by permission. Creator of the heavens and all that is, hear my prayer. Come to me. Whisper softly of your mercy. You formed me into who I am. Of whom but you shall I call? All that I am is yours. You alone are my Lord. Loving Father, hear my prayer. Remember me, King of Peace. Heal me, 
body and soul. You alone are all that I need. Lord of light, author of kindness and mercy, ignite the flame of your love in my heart and every sorrow will flee away. No other compares to you, Lord. Only you can sustain every need. Keep us always in your care, Jesus Christ, Son of God. Guide the moments of time which make our days. There is no other help for our souls but thee. Buffalo, Minnesota, January 2nd, 1912. To Mr. Emil Parisian, Monticello, Minnesota, care of Steve Foltz. Well, you want to be here the 13th of this month, there is going to be a dance over to Oscar Peterson. We had a dance over to his place Christmas. The fish is running good. On Monday after you was here, we got six pike. One weighed 12 pounds. That is all for this time. You want to be here as quick as you can. Willie Parisian. Silver Lake, Minnesota, September 4th, 1908. To Mr. B. F. Plusinski, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Meet me at the depot Monday, September 7th. But if it should rain, then I am not coming until Tuesday. My dear Mama, It is some cloudy, but the sun is trying hard to shine through. I got such a nice letter from Hazel Farnham. The dear girls, I must do all I can to help them in the Christian way. I am quite a little better today. We had a fine meeting there. At the altar seeking salvation, all were grown people. Brother McKee thinks that I am the one for that work. The lake is opening fast. Just wish we could all live up here. The pines are so nice and the air so refreshing. Don't go before I get home. Say, Pa, how is my cow? See, I have claimed her this soon. Don't forget we want 12 chickens. 11 hens and one boss. This picture was taken just north of town. I saw a large one like it. We'll soon see you all, God willing. Bye bye. Hail. German immigrant Frederick William Reckheim was an enterprising man. After saving $200 doing farm work, he began selling his own popped corn in Chicago and soon was able to buy out his partner's share of the business. When his brother Louis arrived from Germany, they purchased candy making equipment in order to expand the business. Their combination of peanuts, popcorn, and molasses was popular after Louis created a formula that kept the mix from being sticky to the touch. In 1896, after a salesman tasted a sample, he shouted, that's a Cracker Jack, which at the time meant something very pleasing and good. Frederick and Lewis thought Cracker Jack the perfect name for the candy they invented and soon copyrighted the name. If you want to know the formula for how Cracker Jack is made so it isn't sticky, you will have to wait because it is still a secret. Hello, here I am back again. Minnie, it is a wonder that you don't get fat because you eat more in one night than I do in one week. So goodbye. Signed, you are the only Cracker Jack in town. Professor Billhorn's new song, Keep Sweet. Peter Philip Billhorn, author of Sweet Peace. Billhorn Brothers, Publishers, Chicago, Illinois. Peter Philip Billhorn was a musician in the late 1800s who worked with the great evangelist Dwight L. Moody and others. To further his work, he invented a portable organ, the Billhorn telescope organ, that would fold up into a case for which he developed many models. Billhorn's surname was originally Pullhorn until changed by Judge Abraham Lincoln in Ottawa, Illinois.
St. Cloud, Minnesota, July 29, 1907. To Mrs. Joe Wiest, Henderson, Minnesota. Came here Saturday evening, was fishing yesterday at Pearl Lake. Had a dandy time at Lake Minnetonka. We went to Big Island Park and heard that Navasar band of 40 women. Had some canoe rides at Lake Harriet and was out to Minnehaha also to a show one day. If you write before Friday, address 8th Avenue South, St. Cloud, Minnesota. Were you to the city? B. Mimbach. July 25th, 1908, the Kansas City Journal. Cupid plays Hava in band. Navasar's manager is kept busy looking for new musicians. A band of women musicians is much harder to manage than a band of men musicians. Most men who have tried to manage one woman will see the difficulty in trying to handle 60 or 70. Managing the Navasar Ladies Band, which is playing at Carnival Park, brings no end to trouble. Not that the women of the band are more fretful or pervasive than their sisters who cook and sew in their own homes, but Cupid interferes. Already this season, the Navasar Band has lost eight members through marriage. When a man musician marries, he usually takes his wife with him for the honeymoon, but the women musicians can't very well travel with a husband tagging along with them, mostly because hubby must have a job somewhere, so the women leave the band when they marry. The band manager? Why, he sighs when he hears the news, congratulates the groom, and searches for another woman to take the bride's place in the organization. Austin, Minnesota, January 14, 1912. To Miss Marie Olson, Route 1, Fairmont, Minnesota. I understand that you people must be very busy when you won't write. Well, I am not so busy. We have a vacation for a whole week. The new term is to begin Tuesday. We are having a frightful cold weather. Here it is 40 degrees below zero every day. Do you know is the beginning bookkeeping I was in last term will be in a larger class next term? P.S. Answer soon. Robbinsdale, Minnesota, July 25, 1910. To Ruth Larson, Stevens Avenue South, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Dear Ruth, we're having so much fun. We were at Osseo Saturday with Mr. B and we had an ice cream cornet. 
Sunday morning we went to Robinsdale to meet some people, Mr. Bennell's nieces and his son Hilmar. We had our pictures taken. Goodbye, Esther. P.S. Twelve people came besides us. We had a swell dinner with spring chickens. Right soon. Greetings, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Today is a good day for sharing an interesting, historical, and a bit humorous topic, Bible errata. What is errata? Errata are the bloopers of the printed page, the typos, the misspelled word, and the not quite so perfect paragraph. Before the printing of the first book, the Holy Bible by Johannes Gutenberg in 1456, Bible text was written by monks sitting on stools at slanted tables in drafty monasteries, printed on animal skins called vellum with a quill pen and ink. As a matter of fact, the quill pen is where the pen knife originated. It was the small knife used to trim the end of a quill, as in a feather to a point for writing. The first time any portion of the Bible appeared in English was when John Wycliffe wrote out and distributed his translation from Latin late in the 14th century. Not until the year 1525, however, was the first New Testament printed in English by William Tyndale. The king, however, didn't authorize Tyndale's work and he was burned at the stake for his effort, as were many of his writings. With an authorized English language Bible in the works but making slow progress, the next edition to appear was the Matthew Bible in 1537, a so-called stopgap effort authorized by Cromwell. Soon to follow was Cromwell's Great Bible, the production of Miles Coverdale. The Great Bible was named for its size, or as Cromwell stated, one book of the Bible of the largest volume in English, and the same set up in some convenient place within the said church that ye have care of, whereas your parishioners may most commodiously resort to the same and read it. Then in 1575, 
the Geneva Bible was printed. It was the Protestant standard for centuries. It was used by William Shakespeare, John Milton, John Knox, John Donne, and John Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress. It was the Bible that sailed on the Mayflower to the New World. The Geneva Bible, in relation to what Bibles are available today, could be called the first study Bible. It was the first printed Bible with marginal notes written by the leading Protestants of the time, such as John Calvin and John Knox. Almost at the same time, work began on the King James Authorized Version of the Holy Bible in 1604. Seven years later, in 1611, the work was completed. Let's begin with two of the best known errata from the past. The first is called the Vinegar Bible. The Vinegar Bible was published by John Basquette in Oxford, England in 1717. It is called the Vinegar Bible because of a misprint in the heading of Luke chapter 20, verse 9, which reads, Parable of the Vinegar, instead of Parable of the Vineyard. John Basket was a successful publisher in 18th century London, but one of his first imprints of the Bible was so riddled with mistakes that it earned the nickname, A Basket Full of Errors. Now the Bible is better known as the Vinegar Bible, so called because of the word vinegar appears in the place of vineyard in the parable of the vineyard in Luke 20, verse 9. The Breeches Bible, so named for verse 7 of Genesis chapter 3, as, and they sowed fig tree leaves together and made themselves breeches. Well, Previous to the breeches, the Geneva translation had Adam and Eve wearing aprons, or as the word was spelled in print at that time, aprons. Why the word breeches? It was explained by an author, James Gurnhill, who wrote a book on the breeches Bible in 1862. Simply put, it was the language of the time that was understood and would make sense to the readers. We must remember that each letter of each word that was printed was hand set into a mold on the order of what I have here. Rather than be concerned about an occasional error in the setting, we instead should be surprised at how few human errors there were. Still, it is not the making of the error, it is about what the error is. For example, the placemaker's Bible so named because instead of the beatitude, blessed are the peacemakers, it was printed, blessed are the placemakers. In the same Bible, it seems that in Luke 21, Christ condemneth the poor widow instead of commending her. The book of Matthew in chapter 24 in 1589 has David speaking of what was actually spoken by Daniel. A Bible printed in 1604 took the liberty of using a synonym for balm, as in balm in Gilead. However, the substance does not equate with the purpose of the phrase, for there really is no rosin in Gilead that soothes the sin-sick soul. Perhaps not too many were printed with this typo edition of the King James Version in 1611, when instead of Jesus saying, Sit ye here while I go yonder and pray. It is Judas speaking. A year later, the printer's Bible was published when Psalm 119 read that printers have persecuted me without cause instead of princes. It just may be that whoever was doing the editing made a mind slip over his relationship with the printer. The Wicked Bible has God in the seventh commandment saying, Thou shalt commit adultery. Only 11 copies are known to exist today.